Good morning, ACC. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Let's worship together. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. 
So church, I'm going to ask you to be seated for just a moment. We're going to take communion. You know, when we prepare for worship, you know, obviously the first thing that I do uh, when I'm trying to pick songs and when I'm trying to, to kind of put together an experience of worship where we get to experience the Holy Spirit, experience God's presence, is I pray and ask God, what is the message that you want to communicate through song? In this particular week, the message that he wanted you to hear is that in the middle of your storm, Jesus' name is all you need. In the middle of your storm, all you have to do is sing Jesus, Jesus, because the battle is already his. And so we're gonna we're gonna take a moment and pray over our communion and take it together. And then I want you to stand for this next song because when we sing this next song, we're gonna do just that. We're gonna sing Jesus, Jesus, and we're just gonna watch God do what He does. We're just gonna watch and see just how strong and how powerful His name is. So go ahead and prepare your your communion elements as I pray, and we'll take them together. So Father God, we just thank you, Lord. God, I pray that as we worship and as we lift your name, that we can, we can do just what you want us to do, and that's just to exalt your name, to lift you on high. And God, today, as we worship together, whether we are in this room or we are at home, God, we are calling on your name because we know your name is all we need. There is power in your name. So, Father, as we take communion today, God, I just pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts, that you would cleanse our hearts, that you would forgive us for the things that we have done, even the things that we have not realized we've been doing. Or maybe we know we've been doing it and we just continue to do it because it, we think it feels good or it just makes us happy or whatever the case is, God. Lord, I ask that you would help us to, help us to do things that reflect you and not reflect us. So at this time, go ahead and take his blood, or sorry, take his bread, which represents his body. Father, we just pray, Lord, that as we take your, the, the, the bread that symbolizes your body, God, I just pray, Lord, that we can remember what you did on the cross, that we can remember what you did in your entire walk on earth, Father, and then go ahead and take the blood, which represents the juice, which represents his blood. Father, today we cleanse, we ask, Lord, that you would cleanse us as we take the blood, and we ask, Lord, that you would solidify everything that we are doing here today, that you would, that you would seal the deal in this worship service, God. As we worship your name, Father, I just pray, Lord, that we can keep our focus on you, and Lord, that as we call on your name, that you would meet us here in this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's continue to worship. darkness trail. 
our hands all over this room. We'll just sing this out real quick. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. And again, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Sing that one more time. Let's call on his name. Jesus, Jesus. His name is above every name. And his name has the power to change lives, futures, pasts. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat for a moment, you know. As we gather together, maybe some of you guys are gathering with us online, and we're so glad to see you. We're so glad that you're here. And if you're gathering with us for the very first time, or, or you're just returning back, back to church, we're so glad that you're here. We're so glad to worship with you this morning. We count it a privilege. Well, you know, there's actually a few things that are going to be going on this summer that we're getting pretty excited about. Actually, there's a thing called Kid Venture Week, and it's going to begin in mid-July. Actually, we're going to split it from July 11th to the 14th, as well as, or 13th, and then from the 14th to the 16th. And basically what it is, is it's just a bunch of kids getting together, learning about Jesus, learning about God, and there's going to be a lot of great things going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Another opportunity that we have, because we want to be an externally focused church. We want to be the kind of church that reaches out to our community as well. We have these things called Go Adventures, and you may have heard about them earlier in the year, but there's one that's still out there, and we're still registering for the next couple weeks. It's actually going to be in August. It's actually going to be in Washington, D.C., and, and here's the thing. A lot of times when it comes to Go Adventures, short-term mission trips, we feel like, oh, I don't have the time. Guess what? It's only going to be a few hours, one day. A lot of times it's, uh, I, don't know about, I don't know about raising money. I, I, I don't know if I'm... It, it can be really expensive. We've, we've taken that obstacle as way, away as well. Guess how much it is? Free. There's, there's, there's no charge at all. We just would like to know that you're planning to join us. And so you can go online to arundelcc.org forward slash go, and you can register for this. We would love to be able to partner with you in this. And here's the thing. If that day you're like, ah, oh, I really can't go that day because I'm going on vacation or whatever, take that day. Take a moment and pray. Pray for those who are going there. Pray for the city. Pray for our nation. Because we want to be a church that reaches out, but we want to, we want to partner with God. And this is one, way, one more way for us to partner with God. In fact, one way that we partner with God each week as a church, if, if this is your first time here, if, if, if you don't know us or anything, then, then here, just step back for a moment and, and say, hey, listen, I can hear about this. I can receive but it's a little bit different here. See, one of the things that we do to partner with God is we give of our tithes and our offerings. We have multiple ways that we can give. And one of those ways is you can actually text 84321 and you can text the amount there. But listen, if this is your first time here, I know that so often people will come to a church. Maybe this is your first time. Maybe you're just returning. And you're like, man, churches are always asking. We're not asking you. <laughs> We're not asking you. But we are given the opportunity as a church to partner with God, to partner with the local church that God works through to reach people for Jesus, to bring about life transformation, because that's what we're about here at ACC. Well, this week we are continuing on in our series called Thrones, and Pastor Matt's going to be speaking, and he has got a great message all ready for you. So check out this video. morning church and it is uh, such a blessing on Sundays to gather together with my church family I love you uh, maybe we haven't even had a chance to meet yet and uh, I, I love you anyways and I would love to meet you if we haven't had a chance to meet maybe 
after service sometime, I'm usually out in the lobby or out in the parking lot or something. Come find me. I'd love to shake your hand. Yeah, we have a lot of really cool things to be thankful for right now as a church. You know, we have Starting Point today. We have 35 people registered for Starting Point. I mean, just to, to think of how God is growing this church right now is really amazing. To think of all, I mean, I, I'm so, aren't you thankful for the team, the musicians that lead us into worship? And I, uh, as I'm thinking about things I'm thankful for, even just the last couple weeks, you know, my, my wife and I, and we've been able, not, not for a couple weeks on vacation, but we were able to get away for a little bit, and we're able to, to, uh, to not have to necessarily prepare for, for teaching on stage. And I'm so thankful that we got to hear uh, Pastor Schmidt for the first time last week teach on stage. He did an incredible job. I, um, there's just a lot of really cool things happening, and, and one of my favorites is this series that we're in the middle of. I've been learning all sorts of things in my preparation and as I'm listening to our other pastors teach. And we're in, we have this week and we have one more week next week of our throne series left. And we're talking about some of the lesser known kings in the Old Testament. And some life lessons we can learn from their uh, successful parts of their stories and their not so successful parts of their stories. Right? When you study the, the kings, you learn that most of them were kind of thumbs down kings. Most of them did not give us examples to follow, but examples to avoid. And uh, that's going to be another one of those stories today. Um, so as we're, we're going through these lessons from flawed leaders, I want us to all remember that we're not just going to point at other people and about the mistakes that they make. We are going to do that a little bit. We're going to look at some real life stories, um, some, some truth stuff, but at the end of the day, we want to be looking inside. Like, how can we see ourselves? We're also flawed people. And how can we find ourselves in these stories? And what can we learn? What can we apply to our own lives so that we can walk out of these doors and look more like Christ? That's what, that's what our goal is. Not to pick on other people, but to, to pick on ourselves a little bit. Let the Holy Spirit do some work inside our hearts. So I want to invite you into, into that. So as we're talking about a, a king today named, named Jeroboam, and say that with me. Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam, we're going to put this timeline up on, on the screen here on our uh, cool uh, projection. And as that is making its way up soon, you'll see that you have Saul and you have David and you have Solomon. These are kings that most of us are very familiar with. If you're in, if you're in the Bible, you've spent a little bit of time in church, you've probably heard stories about Saul and David and Solomon. But, but Jeroboam is interesting in that we get to see really today where the kingdom splits and why it splits, and how that's important, and some of the things we can learn. Because a lot of the, when you're reading through Kings and the Chronicles, and you're kind of reading through the stories of the kings of the Old Testament, what you're going to see is that there's actually like a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, and that's what this timeline is showing. Today, we're going to talk about the first king of the northern kingdom, of this split kingdom. Now, I want to give you a little bit of history, so you have some context. And if you're wondering, well, why did the kingdom split? What happened after Solomon that made it so that there were now two kingdoms? Anybody wonder? We're going we're to talk about that. Let me show you. Now, a lot of us know about King Solomon. He's, he's talked about in scriptures being the wisest uh, you know, man who maybe has ever lived in a ton of wisdom. But we also see in his story a lot of flaws, a lot of mistakes that Solomon made. And at the end of his life, I want to share a couple scriptures with you. In 1 Kings 11, it says... In Solomon's old age, it says they turned his heart. Now, I, I don't have the context of who they is, but let me tell you who they is. Uh, Solomon, basically, you know, he kind of kept gathering wives and concubines. He kept gathering more and more uh, things for himself, including women. And in this, he kept adding to his repertoire of wives, wives who followed pagan gods, who worshipped other idols and other things. And that was a big no-no. He shouldn't have been, he should, first of all, one wife is enough, amen? All right? <clears throat> but he's already adding, I, I made that sound like it was a bad thing. Uh, my wife is amazing, and I don't want any more. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so Solomon keeps adding to his list of wives, and he adds to the list, they. All right? And here's what the, the scripture tells us. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods. Instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God and his father, as his father David had been. And then we skip down to verse 11. It says, so now the Lord said to him, since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my decrees, 
I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. So this was a punishment that God said, listen, Solomon, you kind of went off and started doing your own thing. And because you've done that, because you haven't been faithful to me, I'm going to tear this kingdom apart. And that's where Jeroboam enters the scene. Now, you've got to understand who Jeroboam is. There's two guys you saw back on that, that map, right? There was Jeroboam in the northern kingdom and another guy named Rehoboam in the southern kingdom. They sound like they could be brothers because their names kind of rhyme. But they're not related. Rehoboam in the southern kingdom is actually Solomon's son. He's the rightful heir to the entire throne. He's supposed to take the throne and be in charge of all tribes, all 12 tribes of Israel. Right? He, that's what's supposed to happen. But God steps in and says, Solomon, I'm going to tear this thing apart because of your unfaithfulness. And there's this guy named Jeroboam. He's not of royal lineage. He's not related to Solomon. In fact, Jeroboam is simply a hired, uh, he's basically been hired to, to manage the, the labor force for Solomon. That's what he does. He's the guy who kind of helps to manage the building projects. And, and we, we hear a little bit about him. He gets introduced in, in 1 Kings 11. And what happens is Jeroboam is out. There's a prophet that comes up to Jeroboam. And the prophet's got this nice new cloak on. And the prophet, uh, he probably really likes his cloak, and he's probably really upset that God tells him to do this. But God tells him to take your cloak, your brand new cloak off, and tear it into 12 pieces. And then go to Jeroboam and give him 10 pieces of the cloak and keep the other two. And essentially tell him, this is what God's going to do. He's going to give you, Jeroboam, who's kind of been pulled out of obscurity, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. You are going to be the king over the northern kingdom. And Rehoboam is going to be the king over what's left, these other two tribes. So this is essentially what the prophet says to Jeroboam. Now at this point, Solomon is still king. Rehoboam still thinks he's going to take over everything soon. So this is all just kind of a private conversation. But Solomon gets wind of this conversation. He gets wind of the, this fact that there's this Jeroboam and that he's going to be, uh, that the prophet said he's going to take over like this northern kingdom, these ten tribes, and he tries to have him killed. But Jeroboam flees and hides in Egypt until Solomon dies. So I've caught you up a little bit. But I want to hear, I want you to hear specifically what God says to Jeroboam through this prophet. Remember, there's this brand new cloak Ripped into 12 pieces, Jeroboam, here's 10 of them, and here's what God says. You ready? In verse 37 and 38, it says, And I will give you, and I will place you on the throne of Israel, and you will rule over all that your heart desires. Now don't miss this next part. It says, If you listen to what I tell you and follow my ways and do whatever I consider to be right, and if you obey my decrees and my commands, as my servant David did, Then I will always be with you, and I will establish an enduring dynasty for you as I did for David, and I will give Israel to you. This is a really powerful promise. Now, God is speaking through a prophet to Jeroboam. Remember, he's not even a royal guy. He's just kind of been pulled out of the the ranks of just uh, being a civilian. He's like, hey, listen, I'm going to, you're going to be the ruler over all that your heart desires. And now you get to decide, do you want to do things your way, or do you want to do things my way? And that leads us to our first life lesson from the throne of Jeroboam. There's three today, so if you're taking notes, you want to make room for about three, three life lessons I've, I've found for us. The first one is this, is that God lets you control who sits on your throne. Now here's what I mean by this. When I say your throne... There is a a kind of a seat of power over your life. There's a throne like we have demonstrated here on stage. There is a throne over who calls all the shots in your life. And God lets you control who sits on your throne. You can sit on your throne. You can let someone else kind of run your life. If you want to let someone else sit on your throne, you can vacate the throne and let God sit on your throne, which is the right answer. But at the end of the day, what we see here in this conversation with the prophet to Jeroboam is, Jeroboam, you get to decide if you want to do things my way and let me sit on the throne, 
or if you want to sit on the throne. Do you see? And that's a life lesson that all of us need to learn. When I was uh, probably in fifth or sixth grade, I've always been a nerd, and I'm proud of it. Any other proud nerds in the room? When somebody calls you a nerd, you're like, whoop, whoop, yep, that's me. I make more than you. No, see, I don't know. Uh, it's not the case here. But anyway, um, when, when I was in about fifth or sixth grade, when most of the other people in my class were going out to, to play recess or to go out and play kickball or whatever they did out there, <laughs> I don't know, computers were like a brand new thing. I mean, they were like, the, you know, the, the black screen with the green flashing line, and if you turned it on, you didn't put any disk in there, it would just load up into like where you could program in what was called basic programming language. You could tell the computer what to do. It was awesome. You know, like, you know, line 10 and do this and if this. And I, man, me and another friend of mine, we just loved programming, this com- learning how to tell a computer what to do. And we made this program where essentially uh, we, we put all of the people's names in, that were our friends, right? We kind of had them programmed into a list. And if anybody came up to this program and it said, the first question was, what is your name? If their name was in that list, this program was going to be very friendly to them. Every time it asked a question, it would compliment the answer, right? If their name wasn't in the list, then they got a very different response, a kind of cruel, mean, it was fun. It wasn't like we were being really nasty, but it was just like, oh, what's your favorite color? Oh, that color's dumb. You know, that kind of stuff. But we programmed the computer. There was no way around it. You couldn't, the computer was going to do what it was programmed to do. And here's, here's the deal. God has designed all of us. But in the design that he gave each of us, he has given us the ability to choose whether or not we want to sit on the throne or he's going to sit on the throne. He didn't create you and then force you to do things his way. He didn't say, I'm going to create you and put a little line of code in there where you say, I love you, God, every five minutes. He doesn't force you to love him. He doesn't force you to do things his way. He has created you with the free will to decide whether or not you want to sit on your throne. Like Jeroboam was offered these, both of these options. Jeroboam, you can do things your way, and it's not going to lead anywhere good. Or you can do things my way, and it's going to lead to something really great. We see that same thing here. See, God doesn't program us to love him. Now, this is a bit confusing. There's a lot of theological debate when it comes to 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 understanding, you know, some people say, well, God is sovereign, right? God has programmed certain people to respond a certain way, and that is in the, they they can't get away from it, and that's a a theological perspective. Other people are like, well, no, we have, you know, the Arminian or free will perspective. Well, no, we have the ability, we have plenty of stories in Scripture where people are able to change God's mind, right? Hey, God, we know you've decided to do this, but please don't, and he's like, okay, I won't. Like, so is God, like, unchangeable and his mind's made up or is God changeable and is there free will and how do these things work together well the truth is that they do a hundred percent true that God is completely sovereign and knows exactly what you're going to do and whether or not you're going to sit on the throne or he's going to sit on the throne he already knows what you're going to decide at the same time he lets you decide and when we put all these we're never really going to understand how these completely overlap in this life because we're bound by time and space But God is outside of time and space. He's giving Jeroboam the option. Listen, you get to decide what you want to do. By the way, I already know what you're going to do. But you get to decide. I'm not going to program you. And the same is true for us. We have the ability to decide. I want you to think about this line. It says, love isn't love unless it's freely given. Love isn't love unless it is freely given. I probably shared this with a few of you before. It's maybe a bit embarrassing, but not really when you think about it. The first time my wife and I, when we were dating, we had been dating for quite a while. I already knew she was the girl I was going to marry. I was really excited about finally mustering up the courage to tell her that I loved her for the first time. You know those words, they're kind of hard to get out. Some of you are like, first date, you're like, I love you. Chill, all right, calm down. Like, I, I waited. I was patient. I, I, in fact, I waited to say the words, I love you, until the moment that I knew that when I said them, I was really confident I would hear them back. Because that would have been awkward, right? So I'm sitting 
we're just kind of returning from a date, and we're in the car, and I'm talking to Melissa, and I say, Melissa, I, I don't remember exactly how I said it. It was probably more romantic than, than this, but I was like, I, I, I love you. And she said, thank you. <laughs> now, in that moment, it hurt. I was like, oh, that stinks. That's not what I was hoping to hear back. But when she, you know, just a couple weeks later, said, I love you too, for the first time, I knew it was freely given. It wasn't a, just a, a, a response that she felt like she had to give because I threw it out there and it would have been awkward. It was real. It was love. And love isn't love unless it's freely given. Now, don't, don't miss this. God freely has given his son for you. He is freely offering you love. He loves you, and he's offering you the choice on whether or not you want to accept that free gift. You get to choose. It's not programmed in you. That's our life lesson. God lets you control who sits on your throne. Again, we see that in this promise in, in 1 Kings 11. It says, if you listen to what I tell you and follow my ways and do whatever I consider to be right, and if you obey my decrees and my commands, in other words, if you let me sit on the throne of your life, as my servant David did, then I will always be with you. So then Solomon gets wind of this. He tries to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam flees to Egypt. And then eventually Solomon dies. Jeroboam gets wind of that, and he is able to come back. And, Jer and Rehoboam, remember Solomon's son, now thinks he's going to be in charge of, he's now king. He's king over the whole thing. Rehoboam, king over the 12 tribes. And that's just kind of naturally what happens at first. And then what happens is you get into chapter 12, you have to understand that Solomon had been working people to the bone. Solomon was building temples and rebuilding things and all sorts of things. And he was kind of go, really causing people to work really, really hard. So the people basically went to Rehoboam, the new king, and they said, listen, but you're technically king, but you don't really have our loyalty yet. If you lighten up a little bit, if you make sure we can have, you know, just two days of rest each week, then we'll, we'll follow you. You can be our king. We'll, you'll not only be our king on paper, but we'll, you'll have our respect. We'll, we'll follow you as our king. And Rehoboam hears that, and he goes to get advice by, by the way, <laughs> this is just kind of a note. Remember in Samuel, when they went to Samuel and said, Samuel, we want a king. Everyone else has a king. We want a king. And what did Samuel warn them? He said, listen, I don't think you know what you're asking for. And now the people are probably like, man, we've been working. We're working, we're working 80-hour weeks. We don't have a weekend. We don't have a break. And they're going now saying, ah, oh, this king is just working us to the Samuel warned them, by the way, all right? But Re Rehoboam goes and he asks, he seeks counsel. It's always a good thing to do. So go and get advice from other people. Hey, the people have asked me to lighten up. What do you think I should do? Should I lighten up? Will I lose their respect? Will I gain their respect? Well, you know, what's the deal? What should I do? And he goes and he asks first a group of older elders that had served for a long time under his father. And they said, hey, you should lighten up. And he's like, ah. I lighten up, it makes me look weak, right? So he's like, I'll forget you guys. And he goes and he gets more advice, but this time he gets advice from people that he knows are going to tell him what he wants to hear. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And they tell him, don't lighten up. In fact, because they even asked, why don't you add a couple hours to their work week? And he gets all prideful. And that leads us to this, this place where the bad advice causes the kingdom to split. The people say, then we're not going to follow you. We are going to call this guy Jeroboam, who we already know this is going to happen. The prophet already said this is going to happen. He's going to be our king, and he's going to rule us, and he's going to be over these ten tribes. So Jeroboam is now the king over the ten tribes up north, and Rehoboam is king over the, the two tribes in the south. Took bad advice. God already knew it was going to happen. It leads us to our second life lesson. Here it is. You ready? A life lesson from the throne of Jeroboam is number two, everyone worships. Now, some of you, right, worship, we kind of hear it and we think it's a church word. It's a word that describes what people, when they go to church, they do that. You know, religious people worship. Uh, 
But I want you to understand what we're going to see here is that everybody worships. If you think about kind of the line from Shakespeare, uh, to be or not to be, it's kind of like that. It's, it's not to worship or not to worship. That's not, that's not the option that we have as human beings because all of us worship. That's what I want to show you. All of us choose what and who we worship, but nobody, doesn't, nobody chooses not to worship. I want to show you this in, in here. You think about it just from a few examples we see. Solomon, right, he turned his heart to his wives and his lady friends. He turned from God to something else. Rehoboam, we see that he worshipped uh, pride and power. He wanted to make sure that he wasn't uh, uh, just kind of lightening up the load because people asked. He wanted to maintain his power, so he worshipped kind of that, his ego. And we see Jeroboam, too, that he did the same thing shortly but at the end of the day, whether you're an atheist and you're the farthest thing from believing in God, or you've been a follower of Christ for 80 years, everybody worships something. I want to show you a, a small example of this. Now, I'm not saying that by doing this it's, a, it's an act of worship, but it's kind of interesting. A lot of times when I think of what are some idols and some things that we worship in this life right now, what are some things that we don't even realize that we've made idols out of, and a lot of times... One of the first examples that will come up in a Bible study, right, would be like in a athletics. That we can make an idol out of an athlete or out of a team or out of, you know, something. Sometimes we can put a little bit more emphasis than we probably ought to. And uh, let me show you a, a mural that I, I saw recently. This is, a, hopefully you can see it with the throne there. This is a LeBron James. It was a, a huge, I mean, incredibly large billboard. I, I wish I had some cars down there for you to see the context of the size, but right there across the top it says, we are all witnesses. It's a really interesting marketing phrase. I want to show you where it comes from. In Acts chapter 2 verse 32 it says, God raised Jesus from the dead and we are all witnesses of this. Now, I don't think the marketing company was like, hey guys, I just read an Acts there, you know, this whole witnesses of Jesus, let's do that for LeBron. I, I don't know if it was that overt, but here's the idea. You put a big old billboard up like that on the side of a building and say, man, we are all witnesses to this. We find ourselves worshiping something. All of us, regardless of our position in, in faith, to be human is to worship. You think about it, remember the story of Moses. Moses goes up on the mountain, just spends a little bit too much time up there, and what do the people do? Oh, man, we've got to worship something. Let's, I don't know, just make something. I don't care, just build, you know, let, let's take some gold and make, you know, let's make a calf, and let's just, there we go, let's worship that thing. You see, it's eat, it, it, deep down in each of us is a desire to be a worshiper. It's the way we were created. God knows that there's a hole in us that longs to worship him and for many of us we refuse to do that so we find other things to worship and idolize and Jeroboam knows this Jeroboam knows that the people are worshipers that he is a worshiper that deep down inside they will worship and we see in verses about 26 to 33 of, of chapter 12 essentially that he's worried because here's what happens the, there's the northern kingdom and then there's the southern kingdom. Well, guess what's in the southern kingdom? Jerusalem. And Jeroboam knows, I, I have people of faith, and they have these special feasts that they do, and these special times where they're supposed to go to like the, the temple, and there's all these there's, there's things, and they're all going to go from the northern kingdom, and they're going to travel down to the southern kingdom because they are worshipers at heart. And they're going to go to where they know they're supposed to be to worship, so Jeroboam comes up with a plan. He's like, well, why don't I create my own festivals? Why don't I create some other things to worship? Why don't I create some things that people can worship? And then they don't have to go there and start following Rehoboam. They can stay here and follow me. You see, his pride and his fear of losing power jumps in. And he knows that the people are naturally worshipers at heart. So he creates things for them to worship let me show that to you here in Scripture. 
Notice, by the way, that all the things that Jeroboam makes are man-made. Just like the things that we idolize are, are man-made. 1 Kings 12, verse 28, it says, Jeroboam made two gold calves. He said to the people, It is too much trouble for you to worship in Jerusalem. Look, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. Who made the calves? Jeroboam did. We just move down to verse 33. It says, So on the 15th day of the eighth month, a day that he himself had designated, Jeroboam decided just on a whim, he woke up one morning and said, Nah, today feels like a good festival day. Jeroboam offered sacrifices on the altar at Bethel. He instituted a religious festival for Israel, and he went up to the altar to burn incense. Who created the festival? Jeroboam. So you have these, this incredible picture where you have idols that Jeroboam has created. You have festivals that Jeroboam has created so that people will worship and stay instead of going down to Jerusalem and, and maybe starting to follow Rehoboam. Now in, in the southern kingdom where you have Jerusalem, you have actual things that God has created and festivals that God has created and people worshiping rightly. Jeroboam causes people to worship falsely. And the truth is that all of us have that same option. In this world that we live in right now, there are things that deserve our worship, that things that God created, ultimately God alone, deserves our worship. And then there's everything else. Things that we've come up with. Ideas that we've created. See, who is glorified in Jeroboam's worship? It wasn't, it wasn't the cows. It wasn't these golden calves that were get, receiving any glory in Jeroboam's plan. It was Jeroboam. Wanted to make sure that he was glorified because everyone worships. And to understand specifically, idol worship is essentially just lowering God enough so you can put something else up in his place. And that's what he was doing. We have idols like that. We could spend time talking about them. We idolize all sorts of things. Like I was telling, like sports is a good example. We idolize sports. We idolize athletes. And just that one example. I'm not picking on sports, uh, but just to have that one example. Like who's glorified? In that process. Athletes are glorified. Team owners are making tons of money. You know, television producers are making a ton of money. Big screen TV providers are making... Listen, when you choose to worship man-made idols, other things receive the glory that was meant for God. And that's something we got to be very careful of because everyone worships. So then Jeroboam's story continues into chapter 13, and it leads us to our third and final life lesson. And here it is. Number three, God is always on the throne, even if you're sitting on your throne. I don't want you to miss this. God is always sitting on the throne, even if you choose to sit on your throne. And Jeroboam decides to sit on his throne. We see that story, that it's unfolding. And he says, you know what, I, I was warned. I can let God sit on my throne, or I can sit on my throne. I, I'm going to sit on my throne. And even when we choose to do that, it doesn't dethrone God from the throne. I want to show you something really cool here. You remember King Josiah we talked about three weeks ago? I mean, he was a little bit over here on the timeline. And Josiah, he was uh, very young. He was eight years old when he became king. And then he decided to follow the God of his, of his great, great grandfather David and to do things God's way. And he took all of the, remember, he, he took all the, the things that weren't supposed to be in the temple. He took all the Asherah poles and all the idols and the bones of the, and he had them all burned. Remember that, Josiah? I want you to see how cool God is. Check this out. Don't forget about Josiah. In fact, I want you to put Josiah on the edge of your brain for just a moment. And remember that from Josiah, which was on our timeline over here. In fact, Caden, can you put that back up for me for a second? So you have Josiah on our timeline over here, way over there. All the way back, you follow that bottom line, and then you go up to Solomon and then back up to Jeroboam. We're talking about a 300-year period of time, okay? Now watch what happens in Scripture between there and there. 
In 1 Kings 13, right, we're continuing in the story of Jeroboam. So we're, we're back in 1 Kings. We're not over here in 2 Kings. 1 Kings says that the Lord's command, a man of God from Judah went to Bethel. So it basically at the Lord's command, a prophet steps up to Jeroboam. So Jeroboam is there and, and a prophet comes to see him arriving there just as Jeroboam was approaching the altar to burn incense. And then it says, Then, at the Lord's command, this prophet shouts, O altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A child named Josiah will be born in the dynasty of David. And on you, this, he's talking to an altar that Jeroboam has created. He says, On you, altar, He will sacrifice the priests from the pagan shrines who come here to burn incense, and human bones will be burned on you. 300 years before Josiah was even a thought in anyone's mind. If you want to skip back to a, a passage from, from 2 Kings, we're talking about Josiah. This is what we remember from Josiah. It says, Josiah also tore down the altar at Bethel the pagan shrine that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had made when he caused Israel to sin. He burned down the shrine and ground it to dust, and he burned the Asherah pole. Then Josiah turned around and noticed several tombs on the side of the hill. Okay, Josiah isn't thinking like, man, there's a, there's a prophecy about this. I think I'm now supposed to take bones or something. No. Josiah's just sitting there, and he looks around, and he's like, hey, all those pagan priests that I'm, I'm just now seeing... He turned around and noticed several tombs on the side of the hill. He ordered that the bones be brought out, and he burned them on the altar at Bethel to desecrate it. 300 years later. Here's what this shows us. Is that you can try to sit on your own throne. You can do things your way if you want. God will allow you to do that. But there is no one in this room powerful enough to sit on the throne that controls time. 300 years later, God is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's what that shows us. You see, if God says it will happen, we can count on it. So going back to Jeroboam, remember this prophet has just come to him. He says, hey, hey Jeroboam, just so you know, this altar, one day this, this child named Josiah is going to come and he's going to burn ashes on it. He's going to burn bones on this thing. And, and, and Jeroboam is now kind of processing through what, what he's supposed to do with this information. And this is what he does. This is what I call pulling the throne card. Jeroboam is talking to a, a prophet. A prof, no crown on his head. No throne to go home to and sit on. So Jeroboam is like, listen, you can come in here and tell me whatever you want, but I'm sitting on a throne. And he plays the throne card. And here's what he does. This is what a king playing the throne card would do. He says, Then King Jeroboam heard the man of God speaking against the altar at Bethel, and he pointed to him and shouted, Seize that man! Now, that's definitely playing your king card, isn't it? If you have the power just to, have, just to point at someone and be like, uh, Yeah, grab them. So he points out his arm, and he says, Seize that man. But instantly the king's hand became paralyzed in that position, and he couldn't pull it back. Here's what this means. Jeroboam was playing the throne card, and then God's like, oh, you want to play? I'll play the throne card. You don't even have power over your arm now. You want to do this again? Sometimes we can get a little too confident on our throne, can't we? I have a, a kind of a stupid story from last weekend of being a little too confident. It's a bit embarrassing. I didn't want to share it, but I'm going to. My brother-in-law got married last week in Pennsylvania. So my family, we went down and we were hanging out at, at the wedding and, and the reception. My father-in-law, who collects classic cars, he decided he was going to bring his 70 red GTO convertible. It's a $70,000 vehicle. 
And he's going to bring it for pictures and to make sure that they can get some really great shots and all these things. And, but at the same time, he knows that as the father of the bride or father of the groom, that he's got a lot of different stuff and responsibilities. So he says, hey, would you be willing after the wedding to drive my GTO from the reception back to the hotel? I'm like, yeah, well, first he asked, do you drive stick? I'm like, yeah, I drive stick. A little too confident. I drive like something you go by right now. I've, I drive stick there, but a 70 GTO at night in the dark. He didn't tell me that the, the interior dash lights don't work and that I'm parked in like a dark place and all sorts of other things. And I'm thinking, you know, the wedding's over. I just got to get this car to the hotel. And I'm, I'm backed, I'm, I'm parked kind of on a hill facing up. You guys have been there, right? So here, here's my point. I was a little too confident on my stick driving capabilities, and I backed my father-in-law's $70,000 GTO into the car parked behind me. I'm like, oh my goodness. And that was embarrassing, mostly. Thankfully, insurance takes care of that kind of stuff. When we got back to the hotel, my mother-in-law already knew what had happened, and she had a big arrangement of flowers from the wedding, and she says, the bright side is, I have your funeral flowers already. <laughs> Here's the point. The point is that we often find ourselves a little too confident. We get ourselves in a situation where we're like, you know what? I got this. I know the right decision. I know what to do here. I know how to do that. I know how to drive stick. And we sit on our own throne. And the whole while, we, 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 we sometimes are overly confident where we think that our sitting on the throne is going to somehow change what's actually going on and who's sitting on the throne. You know, one, one example of this, I'm, I'm going to be quick, because I, I, I do have another life lesson I added last night, and I forgot about it, so I have a fourth. But here's, here's this. I want you to understand that a lack of trust always leads to a controlling spirit. When you lack trust, when you forget who's sitting on the throne, what it does is it causes you to start controlling everything. Like, hey, I don't know if I can trust you, I'm going to, I guess I'm just going to trust me. And one of the best ways I see this in the church, and this is especially important, this is a little mini sermonette, especially as we're going into to summer. And often what happens in summer is at churches, we see that, that church attendance kind of drops because there's a lot of travel and it's good, it's all a good thing. But usually when, when church attendance drops a little bit, we also kind of see the, the kind of the money kind of drop a little bit, and that's all right, we, we plan for it. But one of the things I notice, you know, with, with money within the church is that people who have learned to fully trust God, they don't have a controlling spirit when it comes to their finances. They say, you know, I, I, God is sitting on the throne. Why would I sit on the throne of my money? Who's going to trust him? And what happens when we're like, you know, I'm a little, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to sit on my throne. I'm going to hang on to what I have. It's a good example to, it's kind of a gauge in your life as a follower of Christ to see how much do you really trust God in sitting on his throne. You can look at your pocketbook and see, do I really trust God is capable of doing what God says he's capable of doing? That's a little side note for you. Here's a, here's a uh, fourth life lesson. Life lesson number four. Those of you who are taking notes, you're like, Matt, you told me to write three and space it. Sorry. Um, is it carefully choose from whom you seek advice? This is a really good one. I don't want to miss it. Be very careful in your life about who you go to for advice. You see, what happens after this, as, as we're reading through 1 Kings 13, and we're kind of going through the story, all of a sudden we see this story that pops up within the story. I recommend that you go home and you read it. In 1 Kings 13, you're going to see a story within a story. Remember that prophet that went up to Jeroboam 
And that prophet was like, hey, uh, listen. And he's, he's, he's talking about the altar and Josiah, and then his arm is frozen, and then his arm gets unfrozen when he asks God for forgiveness. And so this whole, that prophet, we hear a little story about that prophet. And what, the story goes like this. That prophet, Jeroboam then invites him to stay and have a meal. And that prophet says, listen, God told me to come here, and he very, very specifically told me not to eat or drink anything and to go home a specific way. So he says, I can't stay and eat. I got to go home the way God told me, and I need to not eat or drink anything. So as that prophet is leaving, another prophet, maybe a prophet that was like, wow, that's pretty cool, another prophet. I want to go meet him. I want to spend some time. I want to talk to him. Uh, tracks him down on his journey and says, would you come to my house and, and have a meal with me? And again, the prophet says, well, God told me not to eat or drink anything. So prophet one says, I'm not supposed to eat or drink anything. Prophet two says, I want you to come and have a meal with me. And then prophet two, the Bible says very clearly, tells a lie. and says, well, God told me that you can come to my house and you can eat and drink. Interesting. So the, the prophet one, right? Prophet number one goes to prophet number two's house and says, well, if God says I can do it, then I'm going to. And he eats. And we find out that it wasn't what he was supposed to do and ends up really bad. He goes back on his journey and gets killed by a lion. I, I do, there's a lot about that story that really frustrates me. I'm like, I, I think I would... If another prophet told me that I should, maybe I, would have, I probably would have done the same thing. But it leads back to this truth that we need to carefully choose from whom we seek advice. It's not just a, a lesson from this prophet, but specifically from Jeroboam's throne. Let me show you a few examples. You know, first of all, this, this story of the prophet that's told by another prophet, go ahead and eat, it's okay. It led me to think of this little sub-point A, is be careful when the source of advice that you're seeking tells you what you want to hear. In life, when you're going to get advice from someone and they tell you exactly what you want to hear, it's probably a good sign that you need to be careful. It might be good advice, but be caution, be on caution. And then we also look at Solomon. Remember Solomon, where did he take advice from? Solomon took advice on how to worship from his pagan wives. So that led me to think of this second subpoint, which is be careful when the source of advice has a conflict of interest. You see, Solomon's wives, they didn't really care so much about the, the, the results of, of Solomon and his God. They wanted, they wanted shrines for their God. They had a conflict of interest. Solomon was seeking advice from people that wanted something from him. Be careful when you seek advice from someone who wants something from you. And then we also see Rehoboam. Remember the guy on the, the Solomon's son on the bottom? He went and got advice from older wise people and then rejected it and instead decided to take advice from young inexperienced people who would tell him what he wanted to hear. So it led me to, to this thought, is be careful when the source of advice lacks experience and expertise. If you're going to someone to figure out how to fix your car, you probably want to go see a mechanic. You probably don't want to go visit your florist. Right? So be careful when the person doesn't have experience or expertise in the area that you're seeking advice. And then when we get back to Jeroboam, we see this as well. In 1 Kings 13.3, this is uh, towards the end of Jeroboam's reign. It says, even after this, even after a prophet of God came back and warned him again, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil ways. He continued to choose priests from the common people. Same thing. He chose people to lead that lacked experience and expertise. But then it goes on, and we, we learn this fourth thing, which is this, to be careful when the source isn't pursuing the heart of God. When you're seeking advice for your life and you go to someone, it is very, very important that the person that you're asking advice from loves Jesus and is pursuing their best and your best for, for, for really pursuing God's best in their life and in your life. They're pursuing the heart of God. 
And if you're going to people for advice who don't care about you pursuing God's heart, that's essentially what happened. And if you keep reading in 33b, it says, he appointed anyone, this is Jeroboam, he appointed anyone who wanted to become a priest for the pagan shrines. This became a great sin and resulted in the utter destruction of Jeroboam's dynasty from the face of the earth. So these are just four ideas I wanted to share with you about how to seek advice. And essentially, if you want the ultimate truth of where you should go for wisdom, definitely it's okay to go to brothers and sisters in Christ that have expertise, have experience, have the heart of God in mind that that they are, you know, all those things we talked about. But the ultimate place to go for wisdom, we learn about in James 1.5. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. You know, some prayers, we, we ask God and we're like, well, listen, God might say no. This is one prayer in scripture we know God will never say no. He says, if you ever want wisdom, go to God and ask for it and he will give it to you. The answer is yes. Go to God for wisdom and he will provide it. So I want to close with basically how Jeroboam's life ends. Okay, Jeroboam, he has a son who gets sick. He doesn't heed the advice from the first prophet. He doesn't heed the advice from this second prophet. And his son gets sick, so he sends his wife to go talk to a, a prophet, the first prophet, actually. He says, go back to that prophet who told me I was going to be king and see if that prophet can help us figure out what's going on with our son. And the prophet says this to his wife. I have bad news for you. By the way, I've heard of people saying, hey, I got some bad news. When this prophet says, I have bad news for you, this is like the understatement of the century. Because this is what the prophet goes on to say. Imagine someone saying, hey, I got bad news for you. And then they say this. The members of Jeroboam's family who die in the city will be eaten by dogs and those who die in the field will be eaten by vultures. I, the Lord, have spoken. I mean, that's really bad news. Hey, my son's not feeling well. Can you help me out? I got bad news for you. You're all going to be wiped out. Your whole dynasty is going to be wiped out and dogs are going to eat you and vultures are going to eat you. That's the news I have for you, Jeroboam. So as we always do, we end with this thought of what now? What do we do with these life lessons? How do we apply them to our lives? And here's what I want to challenge you to do. When we look at Jeroboam's experience, here's a couple things I want. I, let me just give you the overarching. You ready? Jeroboam is pulled out of obscurity by God. And he is placed into a position. He is offered a position of royalty that he does not deserve. And then he is warned and he is told, listen, you can choose to do things your way and it's not going to lead anywhere good or you can choose to do things my way and it's going to lead to great blessing. It's up to you. Does that sound familiar? We hear about this and we're like, oh, that's a story about Jeroboam. No, that's a story about us. God loves you so much. He has pulled you out of nothingness, out of obscurity. He created you. And he says, listen, I want to give you the opportunity to be part of a royal lineage. I want a relationship with you. And I'm even going to warn you. I'm going to send prophets. I'm going to send people. I'm going to send my son. I'm going to write this book. I'm going to tell you all that you need to know so that you know that you've been warned. You can choose to do things your way, and it's not going to lead to anything good. In fact, it's going to be worse than being eaten by dogs. Or you can choose to let me sit on the throne of your life and it's going to lead to incredible blessing for eternity all of us are in this exact same boat and I want to challenge you with this specific what now God if you're in this room right now and you're, you, you have been warned God has sent the warning to you he sent all sorts of prophets and, and, and authors and stuff to, to tell us listen you can sit on your throne or I can sit on your throne. You decide. It's up to you. I love you so much, God says. You get to decide. I'm not going to force anyone to fall in love with me. So if you're in this room right now and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you're the one sitting on the throne of your life, the challenge I want to give you today is as soon as the service is over today, I want you to come and find someone from our prayer team. Maybe come and find me, someone with a lanyard out at the new, new or next steps and just say, listen, I want, to get, I want Jesus to sit on the throne of my life. What do I got to do? 
And we will we'll talk you through those steps. And we'll pray with you and, and guide you and lead you into letting Jesus sit on the throne. But listen, if you're in this room and you don't have Jesus sitting on the throne of your life, don't walk away today without fixing that. Don't walk away with the Jeroboam story. It doesn't lead anywhere good. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for loving us. Thank you for the truth of, of just being a good, good God. Thank you for calling us out of obscurity. Thank you for offering us a position of royalty in your family line. Thank you for sending Jesus to give us a very clear direction that because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, we get to choose that because of Jesus' death on the cross, because of his perfect life and then death on the cross, because he conquered death by rising back to life three days later, we have an opportunity to be a part of your royal family. God, I pray that everyone in this room would understand the truth that we have the ability to let you sit on the throne of our lives to call the shots, and we want to do that. And I pray for anyone in this room that's considering that right now, that their heart would just be so pulled into a relationship with you right now that it would just be unmistakable. Now we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Come on, sing that again. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble.
an amazing service. What an amazing message. Thank you so much for joining us today. Listen, I got two things for you this morning, okay? One, okay, guys, Father's Day is coming, isn't it? And, and, and I don't know about the rest of you guys, but, you know, when you came in this morning, you saw something on the way in, and it made you salivate a little, I think. That Yeti box, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> We're just having a little bit of fun as we go into Father's Day on June 20th. We hope that you'll join us on that day. We're going to be having some, some special things. We'll share that over next week as well, a little bit more about what's going on on Father's Day. But one of the things that we're doing, we're just having a fun little raffle, okay? A little competition, if you will. And we'll be announcing who the winner of that raffle is uh, Father's Day in the afternoon. But uh, if you'd like to buy any of those tickets, um, they're going to be available over at the Next Steps area. Um, second thing is a Rundle and Five. If you are new or newish here, and you'd like to learn a little bit more about ACC, who we are, what we do, and why we do what we do, we're going to be joining. We're going to be right over here in just a couple minutes, and we're going to be together for five minutes. And for joining us for five minutes, we got a little gift for you. Um, but hey, listen, do not miss out on what Pastor Matt was saying. If God, if Jesus is not on the throne of your life, if you're sitting there, it's not as comfortable as you think. Because you're on your own. When things happen, you're on your own. But when God is on the throne of your life, He is the one who's in charge of your past, your present, and your future. So don't miss out. Again, he's basically said, if you'd like to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, there'll be people up here. I, you can talk with me. I'll be over there in just a minute doing a run on five. But Matt, anybody with a lanyard would love to talk with you. Have a great week, everybody. Be blessed and be a blessing.